John 15, 12 to 17. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You have not chose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. Good morning. It's great to be with you again, and I always consider it a privilege to be able to spend time in God's Word with you. And uh, this morning, we're going to be looking at John chapter 15, as you just heard read. And as we open the Word this morning, uh, a question comes to mind, and that is for those who were uh, perhaps there or saw when I spoke last, we spent a bit of time in the book of Exodus, and specifically looking at the fact that God calls us to a purpose. In Exodus 19, verse 6, it said, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God was not only calling this people out of a land of slavery to be free, he was calling them not only to be in a land of blessing filled with milk and honey, but even more so he had a purpose, and that purpose was to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation that would communicate God's will, God's way, God's life to a watching world. And this morning as we open up the word, we're going to pick up where we left off because the question is, how do we get there? If God is calling us to be a kingdom of priests, or as Peter puts it, a royal priesthood for his very purpose, no other time than now is the church being asked the question, how do we do church? How do we be a kingdom of priests in a time when it seems the church can't even meet together? in one place or at one time. I'm gonna pause for a, a, just a moment of prayer to once again put ourselves before the Lord and then we're gonna dive right in and grab everything that the Lord has for us this morning. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that this morning we long to be people of purpose. We long to be used by you, to not only know you, but to see you at work in our midst. Thank you that today you are present, you are here, you are amongst us. You will never leave us nor forsake us. You are not a guide, a God who, who plays hide and seek, but a God who longs to be known, to be seen, to be glorified. And I pray again this morning that as we open your word that we would uh, grab hold of everything that you have grabbed hold of us for, that we would allow your spirit to go deep convict, show, and shine a light on the things in our lives in which we need see you at work. Thank you today that you are a God who speaks, and I just pray that anything not of you today will go in one ear and out the other, and that only thing, those things of you will stick to our hearts and minds, that we may be challenged to apply them today in what it means to be a part of your kingdom. Thank you for this, your word and all of it, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we open the word, as read, we're looking at John chapter 15, and that's going to be a springboard for us today, because if the question is, how do we get there? How do we be a part of this kingdom of priests, leading others to the kingdom of God? And we live in a day filled with a call and, and a war of standing up, fighting, shouting, and declaring uh, my right. And, and if there's anything that we're going to build and look at today, it's what's God's will, what's God's way in a society telling us today that you need to stand up, shout, fight, and take what belongs to you. This week alone, I've heard in the news so many speaking about my God-given rights that are being taken away, my God-given freedoms that are being pushed under. God had freed a people, as we read uh, my last time with you, he wanted to make them free. But that freedom came with a purpose, and that purpose was that they would communicate 
God's goodness, God's glory. And that freedom was to be used for something. And today, I think that word freedom is being thrown around in so many ways, in so many contexts, that it's forced me to go back to the word and be challenged by God's definition of what it means to not only be free, but how to use the freedom he's given me. As we read in John 15, it says this in verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. In fact, it was a chapter or two earlier in John 13, verse 35, that Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. If we want to know the beginning place, the beginning stages of what it means to be a kingdom of priests, a congregation, a group that is leading a watching world to know God, here's where it starts. Love. And no other love than this, than that we are called to love one another as Christ loved us. That's a challenge, and that is a high calling this morning, just as I say those words. Because as we look at God's definition of love, again, not a feeling, not an emotion, Not something that completes me. In fact, true love is sacrificial. Not something I take. It has to do with something I can give. God demonstrated his love by dying on the cross, dying for you and I, giving up his life. And this morning as we read on, I want to highlight with you, as always, this morning's scripture, a springboard for us to go deeper into the scriptures to identify if we're looking at this life called to love, or a God who's brought us out of slavery into freedom to be this people, how do we get there, or where do we go from here? I want to highlight this morning something God's been using to challenge me as of late, and that's in 1 Corinthians. I'm gonna turn for a moment to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse one. And I want you to note this, that when you open this letter to the Corinthian church, Paul starts by greeting them in this way. Paul, called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who've been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with who in every place call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Paul was writing to a church who knew the Lord Jesus as their savior. They were sanctified. And yet while they knew him, their worship, their lives, their work together as a church, not unified in the Savior, (laughs) divided in self-service. When we go on in 1 Corinthians, we go on to read about a church that was consumed with self. Paul addresses issues in 1 Corinthians in the next following chapters and verses, a group of people who say, I will sue whoever I want. I will take whatever I want. I will sleep with whoever I want. I will marry whoever I want. I will eat whatever I want, and I will worship however I want. For a group of people worshiping a selfless God who gave up everything for them, They were doing it in an incredibly selfish manner. Everything had to do with what I want, I need, my desires, my fulfillment. And in the midst of it all, Paul is going to address them. And if you want one clear example of just how bad it had gotten, 1 Corinthians and chapter 11 says this. He says this in verse 1. Be imitators of me just as I also am of Christ. I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions 
just as I delivered them to you. Now, as Paul is going to continue on and talk about some of these traditions in the church that they were following. And again, remember our traditions, often ceremonies, physical ceremonies that were to proclaim substance about God, his relationship with us. And if you want to have a a small glimpse into how bad it had gotten in the Corinthian church, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 17. I'm reading in the New American Standard Bible this morning. I'm hoping that it's close enough to whatever your English translation is that you can follow along. It says this in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17. But in giving this instruction, I do not praise you because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you and in part, I believe it. He goes on in verse 20 and says, Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. And I love, as the translators have put it, it's followed in verse 22 by the word what, with a big exclamation point. (laughs) What? Can you imagine? That's like us hosting communion here this morning, putting out the bread, putting out the cup, and a few members coming forward and like Cookie Monster, eating all the communion. Guzzle, guzzle, drink, drink, and leaving nothing for anybody else. He says, you're taking the Lord's cup, the Lord's supper, and can you imagine? Here's a tradition, a ceremony, what's the substance? Celebrating the selfless act of Jesus laying down his life, his body broken on our behalf, his blood shed as a new covenant of hope and life. And yet they're celebrating such a selfless thing in the most selfish way. Some are eating and drinking and others going home hungry and with nothing. That's what's happening in the Corinthian church. And it's not just in the communion. Paul addresses this. And in fact, when we read 1 Corinthians 11, he's highlighting things that they need to fix because there's something he already said to them about a heart that they were missing. A heart that somehow, in the midst of their worship of Jesus, had passed them by. I'm going to turn back to to in 1 Corinthians, and I want to read with you for a moment, and forgive me because there's a small rat's nest up there or a hamster wheel running around, and, and at times, if there's any clarity, the Lord, by his grace, brings it. I want you to note something. Paul talked about freedom. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and we may jump a little forward and a little back here, because Paul was addressing something. And he says something specifically about freedom. Were they free to eat the bread? There was no law against it. But as Paul addresses, listen what he says in 1 Corinthians 9 in verse 1. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? He goes on and says, If to others I'm an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. He goes on and says this in chapter 9 and verse 7, Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense. You see, he wanted them to know something, and that was this, that as a working member in ministry, he had a right for them to help cover his expenses. He said in chapter 9, verse 6, do only Barnabas and I not have a right to refrain from working? As we read on in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 11, he says, If we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share the right over you, do we not more? 
Nevertheless, we did not use this right, but we endure all things so that we may cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple, and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar? So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. But I have used none of these things. And I am not writing these things so that it will be done so in my case, for it would be better for me to die than have any man make my boast an empty one. You know what the challenge is this morning? In a world that's telling you to stand up, to shout, to fight for your rights, what you deserve, what you have coming, what you've earned. Paul talks about these rights in 1 Corinthians, and as he declares to each and every one of them this, oh, I have rights. I have rights, he says, just as the other apostles, to take along a believing wife. I have rights not to need to work while I'm preaching and speaking to you. I want to remind you that the Corinthian church was one of the wealthiest of all the churches that Paul went to. Corinth was a hub of trade and a center of culture and, and, and science. And, and as he came to that church, out of all of them, where was it that Paul chose to be a tent maker by trade? It was Corinth. It was Corinth to which he worked in order to make his own means, to support his time, to minister to them. And yet here he speaks and says, listen, I had every right to receive something from you because I ministered to you. And yet I want to highlight something this morning, and that is this. Uh, I share this, not that it will be done so in my case, but why? We did not use this right. Verse 12, we endure all things so that we will cause no Hindrance to the gospel of Christ. Paul had every right to take financially to a people he was giving spiritually. And yet, he did not take it. Why? He didn't want to cause hindrance to the gospel. He didn't want people to go out and say, oh, here's Paul, the apostle Paul, who travels the world speaking about Jesus. Oh, But guess what? When he finds a comfy place and a rich church for 18 months, guess where he's going to hang his hat and call home? Yeah, Paul's gospel, it's about the money. Paul's gospel, it's about comfort. Paul's gospel is about ease of days and ease of life. You know what? Paul will go on and he will boast about a church in Macedonia, in 2 Corinthians, in that letter to the same church. He'll boast about the poorest of churches that were supporting and supplying his needs while in Corinth. What he calls giving above and beyond themselves. How amazing is that? Paul had freedoms, but you know what he chose to do with those freedoms? Not stand up, not fight for them, not shout about them, but lay them down on the altar of Jesus. That there and in that place, he might see Jesus glorified all the more. That he might, as he put it, be better for him to die than in anyone make his boast an empty one. That's what Paul did with his rights. And do you know what? If you think that's all, he gave up a little income, gave way to a little money, Go back a chapter. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, do you know what he highlights for us? He begins to talk about love and knowledge. He says this in 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 1. Concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he's not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. 
Therefore, concerning, verse 4, 1 Corinthians 8, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords. Yet for us, there's one God, the Father, from whom are all things. He goes on in verse 7, 1 Corinthians 8, and says this, However, not all men have this knowledge, but some being accustomed to the idol until now eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled." Food will not commend us to God, but we are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. Take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Do you know if you read on, you know what Paul says? He says, listen, far be it from me that though my knowledge (laughs) that food sacrificed to idols is nothing, Far be it for me that my eating of that food would cause another brother to stumble and that I might defile or wound their conscience. Paul will go on and say this, therefore, verse 13, 1 Corinthians 8, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again. Wow, that's a stab in the heart to any triple A Alberta beef eating lover here and you're 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 talking to a cattle farmer as we speak those are harsh words <laughs> Paul had the freedom to eat Paul had the knowledge the right knowledge that eating that meat meant nothing because those gods that they were offered to were nothing before the living one true God. And yet, even though he was free, here's Paul's choice. I'll never eat meat again. I'm willing to take my right and for the sake of my brother, my sister, set it aside. I'm gonna go vegan on you. That's what I'm willing to do. That's a challenge. In a society today where we're being told, taught, challenged to fight for everything. Here's what God says. You want freedom? I'll tell you what I'll do with that freedom. I'll lay it down every time. You see, today, take all this, let's bring it to a close here. (laughs) We want to know, how do we get there? We're called to be a priesthood. A people that are shining the light of Christ in a watching world. How do we get there at a time when we can't even meet together in these walls? I'll tell you how we get there. Here's where it starts. Love. Love. It doesn't even start with being theologically right or having the theological high ground. Paul was right. He knew what was right. He could defend scripturally what was right, and that was this, that the meat was okay, and yet love reigned more than his freedom, uh, more than his theology. Here's what he understood, that today, for the weaker, I'm going to lay it down. For the sake of Christ. Just as Jesus laid down his entire kingdom for me. We can be a church like the church of Corinth. But without love. Without sacrifice. Without being able to stop and stand. And this is the counterintuitive way of the gospel. Opposite to everything the world says. Today, the weak are the ones who are strong. Today, it is the poor who are rich. Today, it is those who lay down their lives who will take it and receive it. Today, the Lord has been challenging me in what it means. And I want to tell you something. 
I'm challenged personally by this. <laughs> Paul will go on in 2 Corinthians and boast about that church that was providing for him, giving to him beyond their means. I want to boast for a moment in, in, in a congregation just over the water that, that, that struck me during this time. In a time when we're challenged, and, and, and let me just encourage you, when we're trying to grapple with, how do we do church? How do we be the church? How do we be that kingdom? At a time with a very small church, with a very small budget, the discussion is, how are we going to meet? We're all going through it, every church. When are we going to meet? But as needs came to light, that church said this. You know, we only have so much in our budget for cleaning the church and preparing the church. But rather than fight for our ability to meet together, here's what we're going to do. We're going to open our doors and we're going to prioritize Alcoholics Anonymous to come and meet in our foyer. So that the needy, those who are broken and seeking healing, have a place that they can socially distance and can find a place to find healing and hope in a time of despair. Rather than fighting to come back and use our facility, let's stop for a moment and let's prioritize giving our facility and allowing one of the local organizations who cooks meals and daily uh, delivers them, or weekly rather, delivers lunches uh, to people who are shut in or need help eating, let's let the community use our kitchen so that needs might be met in the community. How about we sacrifice a little, hold back on our right to meet, our right to use our facility, our place, in our time, in our way, and let's let it be used to the people who need it more or need it most. That was humbling to me, to see a congregation willing to let go of what they needed, what they wanted. And we all want that, to be together. Willing to lay it all down. Why? For love. To truly be the body of Christ, affecting not only my needs, but the community's needs. People are not going to see that we are the body of Christ because of where we meet, how often we meet, when we meet, what denomination we're attached to, what translation of the Bible we read when we meet. Here's when they're going to know we're the body of Christ. John chapter 13, by your love for one another. Today we lay it all down, and that's where we begin. As Christ called us, John 15 it tells us this, not only will men know that you are my disciples if you have love, but my commandment that you love one another just, he says, as I have loved you. Today, if you're like me, maybe you've been conned at times <laughs> to stand up for all that's yours when Jesus today has been asking you to take what's yours and lay it down at his feet so that it might be his. If we want to know where it all begins, how we're going to get there, where do we go from here, here's where we start. Laying down our rights. Loving as Christ loved the church and allowing people to see his life shine that light that will have no other explanation when everyone else is taking a group of people who are giving. Why? Because we have a God big enough who gives to us and keeps giving. What a privilege. What a challenge today. I'm gonna to stop there and pray and trust that the Lord will provide the application in your life. And that application is both personal and corporate of what it means to build on the foundation, not of taking, but of giving, not of standing, shouting, fighting, but of laying it all down before Jesus.
that today we might know the life of Jesus in the midst of our heart, our life, our relationships, in all things. Let's give thanks and we'll sing together. Lord, thank you that whenever we open your word, we can be challenged. Challenged in what it means to be a people. A people, yes, freed. A people being taken to a good, right, and righteous place. And yet a people that every moment of every day are called to lay down our lives, just as you laid down yours for each and every one of us. Today, forgive me where I have allowed my convictions, my hopes, my thoughts, my ambitions, my agendas to get in the way of your goodness. I pray, Lord, that you would have your way and that today you would put your finger on my heart in all those areas where I've been lifting my freedoms over others. Thank you that today you didn't just make an example by laying down your life. You gave us your life. And today you desire to be and do and commit all these things to us by the life of your son. Thank you for all of this. In Jesus' name, amen.